All right, so this is chapter 3.3, part 3. Uh, in chapter 3.3, part 2, we had just finished um, talking about the plasma membrane, uh, different aspects of the plasma mem membrane, including the pho photosynthetic uh, membrane structures. And now what we're going to do is move further out, more superficially, uh, within the cell and talk about the cell wall. And the primary purpose of the cell wall is to protect, uh, is to protect from harsh environments. And we already spoke previously when we were talking about tonicity, how that cell wall can be protective. So we'll say the primary purpose is to protect from harsh environments. All right, so then we have the different components of the cell wall. And these differ between our gram-positive and our gram-negative, and as well as our archaea. So let's talk about first our bacteria. And we're talking about the components components of our bacterial cell wall. What we want to talk about, which we've already mentioned previously, is our peptidoglycan. So our peptidoglycan we find only in bacteria. Recall what we found in archaea. Do you remember? Right, pseudo-peptidoglycan. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, so we have peptidoglycan, that is uh, bacteria. And then we have two different parts to this, um, these kind of cross bridges that we're going to talk about. So we have peptidoglycan. It's Structurally, we have this kind of meshwork of peptidoglycan, and we have different molecules of peptidoglycan. And the two different types of molecules, or the two types of molecules, are N acetyl glucosamine or NAG. So N acetyl glucosamine, and the other one is N acetyl muramic acid. So N, oops, I did not even spell this other one correctly here. Hang on a moment. Acetyl, N, acetyl, there we go. N, acetyl, I apologize. So acetyl, A-C-E-T-Y-L, and then N, acetyl glucosamine, and N, acetyl muramic acid. So this one is also NAM, so N-acetylmuramic acid, or NAM. So the structure is that we have these, these two molecules, the NAG and the NAM, and then they're going to work together to give us this good tensile strength. Uh, so it gives strength to these bacterial cell walls, which is their purpose, you know, in order to protect the cell. So they're strong and they help protect the cell, utilizing these two uh, larger molecules as well as other smaller molecules. Uh, so the structure of these are different in gram-negative and in gram-positive. And there's actually, uh, there are two illustrations in your texts um, that show the gram-positive and the gram-negative. So the main difference is that when we talk about gram-positive, so in gram-positive what we see are the bonds are going to be different. So we have, if I can kind of draw here, actually we'll do kind of similar to the illustration. So we have our molecules here. So we have our blue in this case, which are the NAG, NAG, and then the yellow, in this case, are the NAM. And then what we see are that these are going to be connected to each other, but they're going to be connected to each other utilizing these other pentapeptides and tetrapeptides. So pentapeptide means five and then peptide. Um, so penta is five and then peptide is a, a protein. And so our five protein structure and then we have our tetrapeptide, and so tetra meaning four. And so then what we see, if I can kind of draw this out a little bit, similar to the text, 
is that we have these bonds where we have our tetrapeptides are coming down here. So tetra meaning four. And then our pentapeptides are going to be connecting that. So five in between the two. Um, so we have our pentapeptide and our tetrapeptides. And then, so we have the same thing, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then the five between them. And then what we have are some other structures that are kind of between these here as well. Um, so then we have all of these are connected by various peptides, basically, the, the NAG and the NAM and the tetrapeptide and the, and the pentapeptide. Now, when we look at our gram-negative organism, if we put our NAG and our NAM in the same arrangement, what we then see is we just have these direct links. Um, we have this tetrapeptide that's coming down here. So we have our tetrapeptide, but then we have a direct link to that tetrapeptide. We don't have the pentapeptide here. So here we just have the tetrapeptide. And then this is called a direct link. So um, do go into the text and take a look at those differences. My drawings don't do them justice, so maybe you can understand them a little bit more clearly by looking at those images there. So <clears throat> we have our gram positive that has the nag and the nam, and then we also have gram negative that has nag and the nam. It's just how they're connected to each other that's different. And the reason that this is important, again, this is one of those situations um, where you may question why it's important that you understand these things, but it's when we get to later chapters when we're talking about uh, antibiotics, for example. Uh, so we have different types of antibiotics that we're going to be discussing, and this is another situation where we see differences um, between bacteria and archaea and eukaryotic cells, of course, because there's no cell wall. Um, but then also differences between how gram-positive is structured and how gram-negative is structured. And so we have different antibiotics that are going to affect certain pathways. Um, so many of them are going to target the bacteria through the structure of the peptidoglycan. And so this is important for you to understand so that when we get to the chapter talking about the antibacterials um, and we talk about the structure of peptidoglycan, then you'll understand why it is that something can affect the gram-positive um, more than a gram-negative or not at all, or vice versa, the gram-negative and not the gram-positive. This is also how the immune system works. Um, so I can just write down here. So it's important for antibiotic understanding because it affects the peptidoglycan. It's also important because the immune system detects the peptidoglycan. And it's not just that it detects the peptidoglycan, because we'll be taking a look at uh, a little bit more detail, the gram-negative, for example, uh, where that's going to detect the lipopolysaccharide that we see in the gram-negative uh, cell wall as well. Um, but it's just one way that our immune system is going to identify that this bacteria, for example, is not self and is going to then label it for destruction. Uh, so when we look at the differences uh, between the gram-positive and gram-negative, again, we look at the structure differences, which we just discussed, but then also we have differences in the amount of peptidoglycan. We've already spoken about this a little bit when we looked at gram-staining. So recall that our gram-positive organisms, they have about 30 to 100 nanometers of peptidoglycan. On the other hand, our gram negative organisms only have about four nanometers of peptidoglycan. So what else do we have going on here? So we have our peptidoglycan, as we've just discussed, um, but we have some pretty big differences in the amount of peptidoglycan here. Uh, we also have additional layers or different um, pieces to the puzzle here. For example, we have tychoic acid, or TA, 
And what this is, is this is a carbohydrate or a carbohydrate chains that are going to extend through and beyond the layers of the peptidoglycan um, in the gram-positive bacteria. Um, so it's going to assist in stabilizing the peptidoglycan. Um, so carbohydrate chains that extend through and beyond the peptidoglycan layer. So they help to stabilize the peptidoglycan layer. And then they also help some bacteria bind to the host cell. So bind to host cell. Um, so again, um, carbohydrates are sticky. So sticky, it's going to help to bind to or stick to a host cell for some bacteria. So in the case of bacteria, so for some bacteria, uh, it will help in this way. <clears throat> so we have the tychoic acid. We also have mycolic acid, which we've also mentioned previously. And the reason we've mentioned mycolic acid before is because remember when we talked about acid fast cells. Uh, so acid fast cells have this layer of mycolic acid that is more superficial or further to the outside um, of the peptidoglycan wall. So this is an external layer of acid that's found in the family Mycobacteriaceae. So in a micro, mycobacterium, we're going to have our mycolic acid layer, um, most superficial. And so recall that our acid fast cells are bacteria with this layer of mycolic acid. So let's take a look at the differences that we see between the gram-positive bacteria, the gram-negative bacteria, and the um, acid-fast cell walls. <clears throat> so if we take a kind of close-up look, it also there are illustrations in your text that will show this. Um, if we look at our gram-positive, and over here we have our gram-negative, what we see is, so we'll start here, we'll have our plasma membrane. Right, so this is our plasma membrane over here. We have our plasma membrane. And so our plasma membrane is here. And then that makes this this cytosol. So this is going to be inside of the bacteria. So if we continue this around, right, we're, we're talking about this is the inside of the bacteria here. And then right here, this is our plasma membrane layer rather than drawing out all the details here. So then what we have in our gram-positive bacteria is we have this tychoic acid, so these carbohydrate chains that are going to be extending out through, or starting in the plasma membrane here. I guess I went down a little bit too far here. Mm -hmm. So they start kind of in the surface of the plasma membrane. Again, remember that they are anchoring and then what we have, I'm going to draw in blue, are our layers of peptidoglycan. So remember the tychoic acid is going to be holding and stabilizing our peptidoglycan. So the blue is our peptidoglycan. Now, this is our gram-positive bacteria, and this is pretty much it. So recall that our layers of peptidoglycan. We have lots of layers of peptidoglycan, quite thick. Uh, we have our plasma membrane down here, as we would expect our plasma membrane. And then we have our, our peptidoglycan and then our TA, our tychoic acid. <clears throat> if we look at our gram positive, we see something that's quite different. So we have our plasma membrane here, but then we have what's called periplasmic space. Um, and in this periplasmic space, what we have is this gel-like matrix. 
So this is our periplasmic space here. And then I'll kind of write that down here. So our periplasmic space It contains a gel-like matrix. And then we find that between the cell wall and this inner membrane. So here again, this is our plasma membrane. It's an inner membrane when we're talking about the gram negative because then we have this plasma or this periplasmic space. We then have a very thin layer of our peptidoglycan. So remember that's quite thin, so peptidoglycan here, small layer of peptidoglycan. Then what we find is that we have an additional or an outer plasma membrane. So we have our plasma membrane right on top of that peptidoglycan. So our plasma membrane, so then this is our outer plasma membrane. So we have an inner plasma membrane here, we have an outer plasma membrane. Between the two, we have our periplasmic space, which contains the gel-like matrix, and then we have our outer membrane. So on uh, more superficial to the peptidoglycan layer. Then what we see here is that we have our, something that's different, uh, specific to our gram negative, is that we have our murine lipoprotein. <clears throat> so I'll write that down here. Murine lipoprotein. And that's a protein that attaches to the outer membrane, or attaches the outer membrane to the peptidoglycan. Uh, so there's just this little attachment murine lipoprotein. Maybe I can draw it in yellow here. So it attaches our outer to our peptidoglycan. So our murine lipoprotein is the protein that attaches the outer membrane to the peptidoglycan. Then what we have is our lipopolysaccharide. So our lipopolysaccharide, also the LPS, <clears throat> this is a molecule that contains three different parts that you need to be familiar with that we're going to look at in more detail. Uh, so it is going to extend from this outer layer of the outer plasma membrane. So this is a molecule containing three parts. Extends from the outer layer of the outer plasma membrane. So if we draw that, what we would see then <clears throat> is something like this. Okay, so that is our lipopolysaccharide. So right here, our lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. And so that is a huge difference between the gram-positive and the gram-negative um, because both of them have plasma membranes, both of, both of them have peptidoglycan. Uh, one does have this kind of gel-like matrix, not really a big deal, but our gram-negative has the LPS, the lipopolysaccharide. And this, again, is what's going to be important as we move forward through chapters. And that's because the LPS is an endotoxin, an endotoxin. And the three pieces or the three parts that you should be familiar with um, are at the bottom there, kind of like the circle area that I drew before. What we have is called lipid A. So for lipid A, it's actually kind of two phospholipids at the bottom that are attached to each other. And then this is going to be the lipid A portion then these uh, phospholipids, basically phospholipids, <clears throat> are going to be attached, and I'm just going to kind of draw swirls here because what we're talking about are proteins here. Um, so lots of different proteins attached to each other. This is going to be the core. And then this last piece, lots of different proteins extending out here. This last piece is the O-antigen.
So if we kind of looked at my drawing here, we could say that <clears throat> down here, that kind of uh, dot portion would be the lipid A, right? So this kind of circle that I drew down here is the lipid A. Then we have a cord that's attached to then this long portion, which is the O antigen. And the O antigen is what is very antigenic, uh, which is why it's called an antigen, which means that it is something that um, our body, our immune system is going to target. It's going to note it uh, that it's not self. And then that's what's going to allow our immune system to recognize that it's being invaded and try to get rid of the bacterium. But then it's also important, again, for our antibiotics in ways that we try to get rid of the bacteria by killing them. So we have this... Um, lipopolysaccharide here that's on the outside or on the surface uh, or superficial in the gram-negative bacteria. Now the third um, type of cell that I want to talk about just briefly again is our acid fast. So if this is the cytosol here, again we have our plasma membrane. In this case our acid fast cells are kind of like gram positives but they don't show up as gram positive. If we remember, so then we also have our TA here. So at this point, right, if we looked up here, very similar to our gram positive. However, then remember we have our mycolic acids. So our mycolic acids are going to be sitting on top of this here. And then these mycolic acids are what are going to prevent the gram stain from staining this more clearly. It ends up looking um, sometimes more gram positive, sometimes gram negative. Um, and that's because these mycolic acids actually prevent the gram stain from getting in and really adhering to that peptidoglycan cell wall. Um, and that's why if we end up seeing something that looks perhaps gram-positive, gram-negative, we're not really sure, um, then it's a good idea to do an acid-fast stain to see if you, in fact, have an acid-fast organism. Uh, because then what we're doing is we're utilizing those mycolic acids or um, able to use them in this acid-fast stain. So we'll be able to see the difference between something that has mycolic acids and something that does not have mycolic acids. All right, so then really quickly, we're going to take a, a glance at our kale cell walls. So when we look at archaea, remember that we don't have peptidoglycan, but what we have is pseudopeptidoglycan. So it's very similar or uh, looks a lot like peptidoglycan, um, but it is not peptidoglycan. It is different from bacteria because they have something that is um, similar to peptidoglycan, but the NAM is replaced with something different. So it, it replaces the NAM, the NAM portion. Uh, so it's not quite peptidoglycan. Uh, some archaea use a layer of glycoproteins or polysaccharides that serve as a cell wall, so they may not have a similar structure to bacteria at all with the pseudopeptidoglycan. Instead, they may use a layer of uh, glycoproteins or polysaccharides for a cell wall. And then some lack a cell wall completely. So we have some archaea that lack cell walls, some that have glycoproteins or polysaccharides in place of a cell wall, and some that have pseudopeptidoglycan, which is similar to peptidoglycan, but we have a different structure with the NAM. Um, a, a different molecule is in place of the NAM. All right. So then let's talk about um, some other things that are related to the cell wall. So a little bit more superficial or further out from the cell. And we've already mentioned these a bit, is something you should be familiar with, perhaps, from studying eukaryotic organisms as well, are the glycocalyx and we'll talk about uh, S layers as well. So a glycocalyx is a sugar coat, uh, very simply. Um, so we have our cell wall in our prokaryotic organism, or, or most of them have a cell wall. 
Then uh, beyond that cell wall, attached to the, the surface of the cell wall, we'll have a glycocalyx or an S layer. So these things are these different types of sugar coats. So the glycocalyx is a sugary coat. And remember our structure of our plasma membrane, we have those glycoproteins and glycolipids, right? So it's um, made of glycoproteins and glycolipids. So the glyco portion means carbohydrate, right? So we have the protein that's embedded within the plasma membrane, and then we have the glyco part or the carbohydrate chains that are extending off beyond the surface of that plasma membrane. Likewise, we have the glycolipids where the lipid portion is in the plasma membrane, and we have the glyco portion, the carbohydrate chains extending from the surface of the plasma membrane of the cell. The way that these glycoproteins and glycolipids are structured on a cell can kind of give it its own fingerprint, um, kind of like our thumbprint, for example. Um, but it does more than that. It, it, all of these little sugar strands that are sticking out can provide us with two different types of glycocalyces. So one type we've already mentioned, but is a capsule. So a capsule is this organized layer of these polysaccharides or these proteins um, that kind of give a nice solid uh, structure on the outside of the plasma or on the outside of the cell wall. So an organized layer outside of cell wall and it's made up of polysaccharides or proteins. So one glycocalyx that we have, in this case it's made up of polysaccharides, so poly meaning many and saccharides sugars, so many sugars, or proteins make up this kind of solid capsule along the outside. And again, this is going to help to make sure that the cell can stay stuck to things, uh, makes it more difficult for something to destroy it, whether it's the immune system or an antibiotic. Um, so it allows them to adhere to cell surfaces, so um, also to create biofilms as well. So it helps with the formation of biofilms. So let's write these things down. So aids in formation of biofilms which biofilms are a large mass of bacteria as well as an extracellular matrix. Um, so it exudes these kind of extracellular proteins and gel stuff that allows lots of cells to kind of stick together in a colony. So these are colonies of bacteria that form in layers on surfaces. And we talked about different microscopes that could get through those layers as well. Uh, these glycocalyces are also going to hold in water. So main, make sure that we maintain accurate hydration for the cell. Um, some of them are used for protection. And then as I mentioned, some are going to hinder the antibiotics uh, as well as disinfectants and make it more difficult for our immune system for it to fight it. So again, I mentioned that we were talking about the glycocalyces. One of them was a capsule. The second one is called the slime layer. And with the slime layer, this one is less tightly organized. So when we were talking about staining for capsule stainings, you could see a very clear, very strong halo around the organism, around the bacteria. With a slime layer, it's much less tightly organized. So it's very loose, um, can easily be washed off. It's just kind of this sticky stuff around the outside. So loosely organized layer. Um, it's also loosely attached. So therefore it's easy to wash off. 
But either way, these glycocalyces are all going to help with these things here. So the formation of the biofilm, keep in water, um, serve as some protection, um, hinder antibiotics and dis disinfectants. So a glycocalyx is a beneficial thing for bacteria, whether it's a capsule or a slime layer. The second one that's mentioned in this section is the S layer. So different from slime layer, we have the S layer. And this is a mixture of proteins and glycoproteins. So in this case, in bacteria, it's outside of the cell wall. In archaea, sometimes it can be the cell wall. So in bacteria, it is outside of the cell wall in our chaos, yeah, it is used as the cell wall, can be. So we're not entirely this sh um, sure of the function of these S layers, but it's just another structure um, that's outside of the cell wall uh, in bacteria that is composed of these glycoproteins and these proteins give it some stability, um, make it more difficult to access the bacteria, kill the bacteria perhaps, um, but not entirely sure. But we think it can do things like maintain um, the hydration just like our, our, um, our slime layer and our capsules. Also, maybe to do with osmotic pressure. So we didn't mention that up here, but osmotic pressure as it's related to our water. All right, and then lastly, what we're going to talk about are our appendages. So our filamentous appendages that we find on bacteria cells. So there are three types that we are going to talk about. The first one is called fimbria. So fimbria are very short, and we saw this in the image of a, a typical bacteria cell. They're very short, very bristle-like proteins that are coming off of or projecting from the cell surface. And a cell will have hundreds and hundreds of these. It's kind of like um, very, very short hair. So if you were to cut your hair very, very short, uh, little tiny bristles that are coming off of the cell. So short, um, bristle-like proteins. Projecting from cell surface by the hundreds. So oftentimes we have our cell and we have all of these surrounding the whole outside of the cell by the hundreds. Very, very short, bristle-like, and their function is that it allows it to attach to other cells um, so or surfaces. So it's used for attachment allows it to kind of stay stuck to stuff. So again, what I think of when I think of fimbria is kind of like Velcro. So it allows it to kind of stick, excuse me, like Velcro does. The next structure we're going to talk about uh, is pili, or R pili. So that's plural. Uh, pilus is singular. <clears throat> so uh, pili are longer than fimbria. They're still still shorter than a flagella, which is the last one that we're going to talk about. Um, they are, however, longer than fimbria. They are less numerous, so rather than being a whole lot of them around the cell, uh, we may see a couple pili on the cell. So they are longer, less numerous, and then they also aid in attachment. So attachment to surfaces, but then also attachment to other cells. And so one that we'll talk about specifically in a lot more detail in later chapters are, is the F pilus, also called the sex pilus. And this is because this particular pilus is going to allow one cell to attach to another cell and then exchange genetic information between the two of them. So it aids in DNA transfer. between bacteria. And so this is what actually allows for some genetic diversity. So this is how we get our genetic 
diversity because they are oops, asexual. And we'll talk about how they reproduce. But they reproduce asexually, so we get genetic diversity because of this F pillus. This is one way that we get it, is through the F pillus. And so they can attach to another cell and then exchange that genetic information. The last appendage is a flagella, or our flagella. Uh, so these are structures used by cells that are in aqueous environments most often, so a watery environment. So this allows them to move through the water, allows them to easily kind of swim through the water. So structures used by cells in aqueous environments. So a bacterial flagella is kind of stiff. It's a, it has spiral filaments. Um, it's composed of flagellin, which is a type of protein. And it extends from the cell, and we can have anywhere from one to um, multiple flagella on a particular cell or on a specific cell. So it's stiff, uh, spiral filaments composed of flagellin. And then these are flagellin protein subunits, and they're going to extend out from the cell. So they extend out from cell and spin flagellin proteins. All right, so let's take a quick look at these flagella. So actually, let me go back up here. So we we drew a little picture here of our fimbria. We drew a picture here of our pili. If we were to draw a picture of a flagella, then we're looking at something that looks very much like a tail on a bacteria. So it can have uh, one or more, and we're going to talk about the different structures of flagella. So we do want to talk, however, uh, very quickly about kind of the structure of an individual flagell flagellum and that's because there are three major parts that you need to be familiar with. So the three parts of a flagellum. So flagellum is singular. The first is the basal body. And the basal body is basically the motor of the flagellum. So the motor, and this is what is embedded in the plasma membrane. So embedded in the plasma membrane. So if we're looking at the plasma membrane of a cell that has a flagellum, then we have this kind of structure in here, and then this is the basal body. So the motor is gonna be in the plasma membrane, and it has various parts. So if you look at the image in your text, it has lots of different parts to it. You don't need to know those different parts, just know the basal body as a whole. So we have the basal body, then the next portion is called the hook. So this connects the basal body. To the filament. So in this part here, then we have our hook. And then, of course, then we have our filament, which is our third piece here. And then again, our filament is what we were just talking about, where we have our flagellin protein subunits. So then what we have is our kind of tail portion here. So this is our filament. So you should know this kind of general structure of the basal body, which is the motor. It's what's embedded in the plasma membrane, the hook that is outside of that plasma membrane, and that what is attached to the filament, and then the filament itself, which is the thing that will actually be moving uh, to move the bacteria through the water, through its aqueous environment.
Uh, so I mentioned that you could have a single flagellum or you can have multiple flagella. There are different arrangements that you should know. There are four different arrangements. So the first one is monotrichus. And if it is monotrichus, then that means one. So in this case, we have a bacteria that has one flagellum. So monotrichus, mono meaning one. Then we have our amphitrichus. Amphitrichus, in this case, we have our bacterium. And then we have one flagellum on one end and one flagellum on the other end. So we have two flagella in an amphitrichus bacterium. Then we have lophotrichus. Lophotrichus is actually where we have a tuft of bacteria, or I'm sorry, a tuft of flagellum or flagella at one end of the bacterium. So that is lophotrichus. And then lastly, we have peritrichus. So peritrichus is basically when we have flagella all over. There could be more in kind of the back here, um, but we do tend to have some kind of all over the bacterium. So monotrichus, one on one end. Amphitrichus, one on either end. Lophotrichus are, is a um, tuft. Tuft of flagella at one end. Um, and then peritrichus is where we have many flagella kind of all over, all around. So we have uh, different ways that the flagellum move, right? Or different reasons, I guess, for the flagellum or flagella to move. So they have movement in response to various things. So for example, um, maybe I should say movement. So in response to light, so a bacteria may move in response to light. It might want to get out of the light or it might want to get in the light. Um, so if it's trying to move into light um, particularly, then that is called phototaxis. So taxis meaning movement and then photo relating to light. So phototaxis. Uh, they could also move in response to magnetic fields. So recall that we have those magnetosomes or magnetosomes uh, that are going to allow them to um, line up with magnetic fields because the iron oxide. And so in this case, it's called magnetotaxis. So again, movement because of magnetic poles, magnetotaxis, using those magnetosomes. Um, and then we have in response to our chemical gradients. In this case, it's called chemotaxis. So again, movement, and then in response to chemicals. When we're talking about chemicals, however, um, typically what we're talking about is a food source. So chemical meaning it's going to find itself closer to glucose. It's going to move in response to a chemical gradient, meaning there's a higher amount of glucose over there. I want to go use that glucose to make energy and make copies of myself. So I'm going to use my flagella and move myself over to this big area of glucose. Or the opposite, uh, if there's a poisonous chemical, it wants to move away from it, so it's going to move away from it. The way that we describe the movement uh, utilizing flagella are in terms of runs and tumbles. So runs is when the flagella are going to rotate counterclockwise. So ro rotate counterclockwise, and then that is going to allow the cell to move forward. So that's considered a run, is when it is moving forward, and that's because the flagella is moving counterclockwise. <clears throat> so we have our 
cell, the flagella, a run. So it's going to be moving counterclockwise, and then it's going to be moving forward. Then we have our tumbles. And in our tumbles, then our flagella are moving or rotating, let's see, rotating clockwise. When it is moving clockwise, we have our flagella can be splayed out and then it's reorienting the direction. So the flagella are splayed out. And then what we're doing is reorienting the direction. So when we are tumbling, then what we're doing is we're moving the direction of the cell. Um, so if, for example, what we had here, this was a run, then when we're moving the opposite direction, the flagellum is moving this way, then what we see is movement in this direction. So it's going to tumble in an opposite direction. And so then when we utilize, or when bacteria utilize the flagella or flagellum, um, what we see are a series of runs and tumbles and runs and tumbles. So it'll, it'll run and then it'll tumble for a bit. And then it'll run and then it'll tumble um, in order to get itself into the correct location. So we increase the running and decrease the tumbles when there's an attraction. So increase the runs and decrease the tumbles when attraction or attractant exists. So then running can equals tum running will equal tumbles when no attractant exists. So it'll just be random motion kind of moving around, not really going in a particular direction. So uh, we can say runs equals tumbles when no attractant exists. So we can just say this is kind of random motion. And so this is how a cell that has a flagellum or fl has multiple flagella are going to move. Again, what we're talking about in this case is due to light, for example, in phototaxis, a magnetic field in magnetotaxis, or a chemical gradient in chemotaxis. And the chemotaxis is what we see the most. So when we're talking about chemical gradients or chemotaxis, excuse me, um, that's what we're talking about the most because we're, we're seeing that the bacteria are going to move toward their energy source, for example, or away from a lot of dangerous chemicals like antibiotics. Um, so we see this kind of movement the most. So that sums up our chapter 3.3, 3, um, talking about our unique characteristics of our prokaryotic cells. You should know the rest of the chapter. You should know all about the eukaryotic cells and their different characteristics. We're not going to go over them specifically in this class, but there will be questions in the class related to it. And it's going to be assumed that you understand and you know those concepts from previous courses. So make sure you familiarize yourself with those things, uh, but really do focus for chapter three on 3.3, um, because this class we're going to focus mainly on bacteria and archaea, and so it's important that you're understanding our prokaryotic organisms and what's unique to them.